So up next, um, we have Tanisius and Eliza. Um, so I will be running the uh, presentation um, on my, my end. Um, so let me just give me one minute. Okay, um, Liza and Tanisius, if you are ready, please go ahead. Oh, hello, I'm Eliza, and I'm going to pre be presenting with my colleague Tanisius Underwood on recognition of frog calls. Could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so there's a wealth of biological information within the field. Um, and surveying species richness is actually a very time-honored tradition. Traditionally, this is actually done in person. Um, frogs are an interesting case study because they're not easily seen, so most people have to actually listen for them. Uh, when you do an in-person survey, uh, usually you'll send out undergrads and they'll listen, write down what they hear. Um, it's a bit convoluted, so we decided to streamline all of that into an automated system through Jetstream. Uh, this involves picking it up with a recorder or a Raspberry Pi and then pushing it through. Today we're going to be mostly talking about the neural networks and random forest applications. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, so you can't just throw audio into a model. Um, it's always wise to pre-process the data. We pre-processed it uh, two ways. We began with an R package known as Warbler R, originally designed for birds. For birds. We turned it on its head and we actually uh, made it so it would automatically select for signals that excluded birds and excluded um, other types of calls, um, but accepted frog calls. Uh, this created two different outputs. One of them goes to the random forest and that's a giant CSV of 26 different features. We added the month of calling as a feature um, and that goes directly into that model. The neural networks accept tiny sound clips that we pulled uh, from the raw audio. And as you can see down below, we have a very large data set from the National Park Service. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, oh, thank you. Yes. So the random forest is actually made up of a decision tree on the next slide. Uh, the decision tree is um, very large and in the gray box outlined is about a sixth of the size of the actual tree. It's very wide. It has depth to it. Um, you can see at the top it splits off. Every single of those splits is a binary, yes or no, and it just keeps on going down until it comes up with a prediction. Um, and those predictions have a positive probability, so it's like 90% chance of it being this, and I'll explain that uh, in the next slide. Um, because the tree is so large, you need to tune and prune it. Uh, tuning is going to help increase the accuracy, while pruning will prevent overfitting to the training data, so it won't accept novel data. Um, so on the left, you have basically uh, all the features lined up um, by Gini Importance, which is an algorithm that's very common. Um, and we can rank them, and using that, we cut off 26 features down to 14 to prevent overfitting. On the right, we have um, a curve that shows how uh, the tree depth affects accuracy. Accuracy grows, but then you see uh, the cross-validation line split from the training accuracy line, and that shows actually overfitting. So we cut off the tree depth at about 10. Um, the next slide, please. Um, the random forest model is going to be less volatile than one tree, and that makes it uh, good at accepting new data. On the right, you have a confusion matrix, and from the top left to the bottom right, um, you'll see the positive probabilities. Um, and uh, like I said before, it will classify uh, whichever has the highest probability. So even if, you know, spring people only has a 60% probability, it'll say yes. So what we did is what we made an 80% threshold, so anything below that gets classified as unknown, and that's consistent with FrogWatch USA training requirement that people have an 80% accuracy in predicting species. And now my colleague will talk about the convolutional recurrent neural networks. 
Uh, next slide. Next. I would like to start off with the input. Uh, when it comes through from that warp or R package, it is then input into a series of transforms. And as you can see, the first transformation being the fast Fourier transform, which is basically a sine cosine function that takes time and it produces and inverts it into a amplitude or frequency over time uh, equivalent. And as you can see right there to the, to the diagram on the right, there's also another picture which of the male frequency co coefficient and that is what we actually are putting into our neural networks because it is a more valid, a more uh, fingerprint-like index for us to determine, for our models actually to determine exactly which frog species is which. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to show you this slide because it shows you exactly how skewed our data was when our model first began and how much we had to normalize our model to fit uh, and be able to actually go in and grab the smaller subsamples of the wave files that you see here. Next slide. This will give you the architecture behind our actual convolutional and recurring neural networks. As you can see, the most uh, optimized thing that we did from last year's project was added batch normalization, which is a regularization technique. Uh, for recurring um, for convolutional neural networks, which allows for it to not overfit and actually uh, increases the training accuracy. And as you can see in the recurrent neural network, the biggest thing that I would like to point out here and how they differ is that the LSTM, which stands for the long short term memory layer, has the propensity to actually pass information from one node to the next, but it retains that information which is passed through those weights and those uh, activation functions. And it allows the, it, the input data from one node to the next to be relatable and relevant. Uh, next slide. All of this to say that all of our models, the recurrent, the random forest, and the convolutional models that we have chosen, all predicted above 97% accuracy in between eight and nine of the frog species that all of our models classified. And for me, that is superb because that was what my goal was coming into this year was to get especially the recurrent neural network and the convolutional neural network percentages up and functioning on more than the four calls that we first began with. Next slide, please. Which now you will be giving a model comparison. And here you can see not only the exact accuracies, but the time to build and predict for each model. And the thing that we were gonna focus on more so than the accuracy, because all of them seem to have more of a relevant 97 percentile accuracy, we wanted to focus on how much time it took to build and which of the three had better predictions when it came to the multi-call trials. And as you can see by our results, it was the random forest and the recurrent neural network that actually did the best by our metrics. Next slide, please. And because we've worked so hard, we've actually been able to allow to put this image on Jetstream. And here are the allocations that are been made for these two platforms, the bioacoustic data collection and the fraud call analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza and Tanisius. I know I've stopped sharing my screen so I can see the chat again. So if anyone wants to put a question in the chat, we can relay it. I guess we can start with um, the, two, the two repeated questions actually. Um, what did you find most beneficial um, and challenging about the virtual experience? Uh, being that I actually got to participate last year in the on-campus involvement with this REU, I could say that the, one of the challenges for me was actually not being there, not having the camaraderie that we have, not being able to see Winona, not being able to physically talk to Dr. Sherry Sanders and Harmony to actually see them face-to-face -face and get their particular expertise in the moment. 
And that's often what is missed, like the in the moment need for complete explanation and validation of a concern. But as far as I would say the benefits to it, it made me have to rely more on myself and continue to research and research and research even when I didn't know what to do. I just had to continue to research it and hope that I find a way and we did. So it, it added a little bit of extra fortitude to my research. Yeah, uh, I would like also like to add that um, both Tunisius and I were watching over our family's kids during the research, so um, that was fun. Taking care of the kids is great. <laughs> yeah, y'all lucky he's inside today. He'd be out here right now, I promise. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, certainly more more family time than you ever knew you wanted. <laughs> okay, we have a couple of questions. Oh, um, the other one about what um, could Jetstream do better for you? Uh, I, I use the GUI a lot, so the web shell. So if you could just make it just a little bit more like functional, so it's not so clunky and, uh, and pixelized and it's not such on a small scale and kind of make the window a little bigger, that would be definitely helpful as far as the functionality. That's great feedback. Thank you. No problem. Eliza, you want to follow? Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think the um, the GUI is a really good place to start for most people, and making that as accessible as possible is a great idea. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we've got two questions. Uh, let's see. Oops. Uh, let's. I'll. These are both. One for uh, from Dennis Gannon. There we go. Um, have you read about transformers as a replacement for recurrent neural networks? No, I have not. Not at all. So when we go to write that paper, we will take that comment in mind and do a little further inquiry. Thank you. Uh, okay, for uh, this one's from Jonathan. Um, what size instances were you using to host the neural networks? Um, also, is uh, build time the time required to train uh, the network, or is it something else? That is definitely time to train the network. And I use the small uh, flavor. Uh, yes. So the there's actually two VMs. One of them has the models on it, and one of them has the web page and everything in the pre-processing. Uh, the web page one is massive. It actually has a giant volume track um, attached to it. I think it's like at least 50 gigabytes, and then the um, the models can be as small as you want. It's very quick. It just goes to the models and comes right back. Okay, we've got. Um... One more from Dave Hancock. It's great that to have both of you back uh, building upon prior work. I believe that both of you said the REU program in, uh, impacted your future education slash career goals last year. Um, how did this year further those goals? Uh, for me personally, I have a lot of input with Winona about how I should go about my process or how I would go about my process of picking a grad school and the fact that she was my one determining factor in going to grad school. She led me the way down that yellow brick road saying, sir, you're going back, you're going to grad school. I don't know what you're thinking, but it's, it's a great thing for you. And so like without her, I probably wouldn't have even thought about going to grad school. So this internship has affected me and impacted me, not just and my academic success or my future career goals as far as me picking my uh, final place that I'll call my future alma mater, but it's affected me on a personal level as well. Thank you. Are you going to tell us where you're going now? Kentucky State uh, University for Cybersecurity. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. All righty. Eliza, 
you next. Um, yes, I think grad school is the, is the move. Um, there's been a lot of factors, but um, getting my start, especially in, in the same women's research program that I was in with Haley, um, that really changed things. Um, so thank you guys so much for that. And the mentorship is incredible and I couldn't ask for anything better. That's great. Um, yeah, my high regard to the uh, Center for Excellence for Women in um, IT. That's uh, an outstanding organization and has provided us with wonderful uh, students. So uh, I'll make sure to relay that to Maureen. Thank you. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, so lots of comments and congratulations in the um, in the, the chat. Thank you so much. Um, students, you should go look at those uh, for sure. Um, so this concludes um, the, the final presentation or the final uh, lightning talks for, for the REU students.